90 live. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. <laughs> Welcome everyone to Give God 90. My name is Sherry Mitchell and normally you would be seeing two people here on a night like this. Uh, Myra has feeling is feeling a little under the weather so she's not with us right now so keep her in your prayers. Not exactly sure what is going on with her but um, well little cough, little upset stomach, some other things going on. Hi, Kathy. Hi, Pam. Glad to see you. So, she is resting. Um, she did not leave me completely unsupervised. That is important to note. <laughs> Want to make sure for everybody um, <laughs> for everybody who listens uh, on Tuesdays, or on, sorry, on Mondays and Thursdays. Mondays is podcast only. We don't do anything on Facebook on Mondays. That's at 10 a.m. Uh, Eastern Time. That uh, relates to 3 p.m. in Universal Time. Also, don't forget, <clears throat> uh, when we're live on Thursday nights, it's actually 12.30 Universal Time. So keep track of that for all my folks overseas. Uh, that way you don't get confused and say, hey, what time was that again? I will try to remember to do that a few times. Uh, if you're on Facebook, you see Mari just popped up. She's, uh, she's checking up on me. Even even when she doesn't feel good, she keeps tries to keep me straight. That's a good thing for me. Um, today is kind of an odd day in the United States, and I don't like to get into a lot of political stuff uh, with Give God 90 because we have so many people all over the world. You know, it's not just uh, American politics we need to be concerned with. We need to be, you know, Uganda is actually going to uh, next week. The 14th, I believe it is, is when they finalize their selection process for their president. And it's it, they do things a little different, but it's still kind of a, a, a way to do things. I did see uh, a comment today that the problem with Africa is so many uh, leaders in power don't want to give up their power. Well, we have the same problem in the United States, don't we? Uh, so many leaders in power don't want to give up their power. Uh, fortunately, you know, the one good thing... And I know everybody saw this on the news. The one good thing uh, that came out of yesterday is our representatives now are actually governing from a position of fear. They need to be afraid of us. They need to be afraid of us. Um, we elect them. They shouldn't fear for their lives. You know, it's not like we're going to break down the doors and take them out and lynch them, right? But they should be in fear. Now, in the state of Delaware that I live in, we don't have the opportunity to recall our representatives. So, you know, we are limited as to what we can do. We have to wait for that election cycle and then hope people are intelligent enough to elect someone else. Other states have that opportunity, and I hope they begin to use it. Um, these, these people need to understand they don't get in there and work for foreign countries. They work for the American people. Around the world, this needs to be noted. Why is this important, especially now for such a time as this? If you remember several months ago, I gave a warning, and I don't want this to sound like I'm gloating. I don't want this to sound like uh, uh, I told you so, okay? I warned when... Uh, Jonathan Kahn and Franklin Graham kind of got together and they, they had the uh, call for revival in the United States down in Washington, D.C. And I know that Jonathan Kahn has spent, uh, written some books and, and made a lot of money convincing people that, oh, if we look at what happened in ancient Israel, we can see what's going on in the United States right now. And I warned you then, and I'm telling you now, don't count your chickens before they're hatched. Uh, the United States is not specifically mentioned in Scripture. 
it's it's thrown in with that all the other nations. It, they're, they're all lumped in there together. Okay, so when we think about uh, what the United States, the United States has a, a glorious past. And as long as it adhered to some things, it was, it was a really nice place, right? We, we said, okay, we're going to base our morals and our ethics on Scripture. And as long as we did that, we had a really good run. Uh, over the past probably 30 years now since Clintons were in office, that has been thrown out. Um, the Clintons were the first uh, presidential family that I am familiar with that would openly assassinate American citizens. Yes, I just said that. The, the Clinton administration openly assassinated American citizens. Uh, they got really good at convincing coroners that somebody is perfectly capable of shooting themselves in the back of the head twice. I don't know how they were convincing them of that, but they did. Um, you know, some of these people, I have personal friends that knew these people. Um, it, it's not just wasn't a good situation. Since then, the decline of the United States has continued to what we see today. If there is a silver lining, hopefully, hopefully, all of the people who claim, who claim to be good, upstanding, decent, righteous people are now going to get together and say, you know what, maybe it's not, maybe we can't depend on just being an American citizen as a step in the right direction any longer. Maybe it's something we have to do ourselves. And that uh, may be the silver lining. And ladies and gentlemen, if you're listening to this, you are in a position to be able to teach this to people. You are already, if you've been listening to me, no matter where you live in the world, no matter what kind of, of government you live under, whether it is a, a, a form of republic or democracy, whether it is a form of dictatorship, whatever it might be, if you're listening to me, you have the knowledge, you have the information, uh, and you have the authority to influence and intervene the people around you. You can make a difference, and you should make a difference. Uh, this is Things are going to get bad not just in the United States, all over the world. And it's getting that way because um, basically we just flat out let God down. Let's just put it that way. We let the Almighty down. We have failed uh, in our duty to respect our Creator, which leads me uh, to what I want to talk about tonight. When I sat down and thought about this, this actually comes from a couple of conversations I had this week and a comment from a friend of mine. And, you know, I, I, I titled part of it, you know, you can't live in New Jerusalem unless you live here and now. But really, really, what it's all about is everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to go right now. Why? Why? One of the conversations that I was part of was someone had asked the question, what really do I need to do to be saved? And I made the comment, that's the wrong question. We already know. The answer is given. It, it, it's been asked, it's been answered. Maybe I should fill you in on where the answer comes from. Um, I wish Myra was here to read this, <clears throat> but she's not. So I'm going to look at... Now, this is actually recorded in a couple of different places. Uh, I'm going to read the Matthew account. It's also in Luke and in Mark. Uh, and I'm actually reading this from King James. So it says, Behold, one came and said to him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? He said to him, Why do you call me good? There's none good but one, that is God. But if you will enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which? Jesus said, Thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man said to him, All these things I have kept from my youth. 
what do I lack? Jesus said to him, If you're so perfect, go and sell what you have, give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, then come and follow me. Christian pastors will look at this and they will concentrate on sell what you have and give it to the church. I'm going to tell you right now, the church does not need your money. Okay? They have enough. Now, in my second book, uh, God's Universe, God's Rules, I lay out that if you are a member of a organization that calls itself a church, you have an obligation to help that organization pay its bills. But that's not what a church is. That's not what a church does. More on that in a second. We uh, look at this passage, and what sticks out in my mind is, is a few things. The same question, what do I need to do to be saved? What do I need to do to have eternal life? Yeshua's answer was very straightforward. There's nothing uh, controversial about it. He says, well, you've got to keep the commandments. He says, what do you mean I have to keep the commandments? Well, it's simple. You have to keep the commandments. Which ones? All of them. He starts out with a short list, but it's basically all of them. The guy says, what am I missing? What am I missing? That's his question in in verse 20. I've done all that. What am I missing? Give me something. What he's really asking, what he's really asking is, isn't there a shortcut? Isn't there a shortcut that I can do that I don't have to do those things? I've been doing them. Isn't there an easier way? He never offers an easier way. He says, look, if you're so perfect, if you've done all this and you're, you're caught up, <clears throat> and it's, it's really interesting that he uses the word, if you're so good, if you're so perfect, if you're such a wonderful person, you just sell what you have. You come along with me because that will, you will be in the right place at the right time. Now, I know a lot of people are going to uh, say, but, but you know what? That's not what I grew up wearing. That's not what I grew up listening to. Paul said, if you're one of those folks who are sitting out there listening to me, or standing out there listening to me, riding in your car, whatever you're doing, And you hear this, and you say, but Paul said, you're part of the problem. And I'm going to be straightforward and honest with you. You are part of the problem, because what you have just done is you have given Paul more authority than you have given Moses, and you have given Paul more authority than you have given Yeshua. It's that simple. Stop doing that. Our modern Christian churches have chosen to ignore their purpose. If you look on the internet and you pick a denomination, I don't care whether it's uh, Baptist, Methodist, Lutheran, any Protestant denomination, and you look up their purpose, they're going to somewhere in there, all the ones that I looked up, uh, talk about the Great Commission that we find in the end of Matthew. Go make disciples. That's not what they're doing today. They're not making disciples. They're not teaching people to live. They're teaching people how to die. It's that simple. I've heard it out of the pulpits. Don't you want to go to heaven when you die? What must I do to have eternal life? You've got to live here. You've got to live now. You've got to do the right thing now so you can get where you're going. You can reach your destination. Now, there's a lot of people who say, oh, you know what, that's not a salvation issue. Yeshua says it's a salvation issue right in Matthew 19, verse 17. If you will enter into eternal life, keep the commandments. That's a salvation issue, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. That's the only uh, gender you get from this person sitting here. Folks, we are not, we are not supposed to be looking at getting into heaven. We're supposed to be creating disciples. 
The whole concept of do you want to go to heaven is straight out of Greek polytheistic thinking. It comes from the pagan concepts of heaven and earth. It comes from... Uh, I'm going to use this example. What does Islam teach? Do you want to go to heaven? Where in Scripture does it teach, do you want to go to heaven? Other than in the made-up Scripture and in the mistranslations we get in our modern Christian churches. See, our modern Christian churches are failing. They really are. And they're not failing because people aren't going. There's a lot of people going, still going to churches. A lot of them aren't. They're finding smaller study groups. They're finding places where they can get together and actually study Scripture. Imagine that. You know, where you're not sitting there listening to someone tell you what it says. You're actually learning what it says. By the way, if you think Paul had more authority than Moses or more authority than Yeshua, maybe you should go study the book of Deuteronomy and commit all of that to memory. Not a translation that you can just spew out verbatim, but understand what it means. And I mean really understand what it means. You know, there's churches that have regular attendances of Ten to 15,000 people a week, other than during COVID season, of course. Olstein's church, over 15,000 members. And you know what? Little side note, they keep him in a lifestyle that I would really like to become accustomed to. Just saying. Go visit GiveGodMoney.com. Hit that uh, uh, su uh, support button down there. You know, I don't need a private plane. I'm not that greedy. Just saying. My goodness. Myra's probably wishing right now that she was down here kind of keeping track of me. <clears throat> but that's okay. People are going to church. And when they're not, the churches look around and say, what do we do to get people back in the doors? They go hire professional mu musicians. Hey, Carol. Oh, thank you. Yeah, she's um, <laughs> she's a little under the weather. You know, we were at Philadelphia Airport last week, so I'm not sure where she picked this mess up, but whatever it is, um, not sure exactly what to call it. Uh, other than a little bit of a cough, I have been unaffected and hope to continue that way. Um, but, you know, that's just me. Um Anyway, getting back to this, these churches look around and they say, well, we've got we've to have better music. So they go hire professional musicians, but the churches are still, still failing. They have people attending. They have people sitting there listening to good music, but they're failing. You know, a lot of people think, well, churches are failing because you know, the economy's bad. Have you seen some of the churches? Have you seen Joel Olstein's two houses in Texas? Both with a swimming pool. One is a measly 5,000 square feet. I'm not sure what that equates to for my people who are listening overseas in uh, uh, metric units of measure, but it's, it's a huge house. Um, about... Four times bigger than the one I live in currently. Like I said, you all get you all need to start hitting that support button a little more. I'm, I I could be a Joel Olstein. I could live like that. I'm not sure I could say the things he says, but I could get used to living like he lives. Yep, I could. So people are going to church. They're listening to music. They're giving money, and the churches are still failing. They've lost their purpose. The church has lost its purpose. It may be giving money to the poor people. 
It may be handing out food. But that's not the purpose of the church. The purpose of the church is to create disciples. The purpose of the church is to convince people to follow their perfect example. The church today, well, most churches today, are terrified to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Instead, what they're saying is, all you have to do is promise. You just have to believe. You just have to say, Jesus is Lord, and you can go to heaven. Well, you know what? The demons say that. Do you think they're going to heaven? Do you think they're going to follow the Creator's instruction? Is this a salvation issue? You bet it's a salvation issue. You know what Webster... Noah Webster, in 1828, he defined a disciple as a learner, a scholar, one who receives or professes to receive instruction from another. In his second part of that definition, a follower and adherent to the doctrines of another, hence the constant attendants of Christ were called his disciples, and hence all Christians are called his disciples as they profess to learn and receive his doctrines and precepts. Well, they claim they're learning, but they're not following his doctrines, they're following their own doctrine. You've heard me say that how many times? I, I love the, the argument, well, our doctrine's based on Scripture. So is the doctrine of the Satanic Temple. Tell me something else. Prove to me. Who are you following? Whose disciple are you? The Almighty's? I don't think so. I'm not seeing evidence of that in most churches. Now, if you're part of a church that does this, bless you. Stick with it. Get stronger. Get motivated. Get out there and push. But what I see and the people I talk to the reason they are so frustrated is because their churches are not doing this. We don't have the luxury of time anymore, ladies and gentlemen. All around the world, all around the world, the battle of good and evil, and that's the only way I can describe it, it is a battle of good and evil, is beginning to heat up. And it's not just here in the United States. It's just... And this isn't... This isn't a political battle. You know, this isn't about Democrat or Republican. This isn't about conservative or liberal. This isn't about left or right. This isn't about black and white. This is about good and evil. You know, people claim they love God. People claim they follow His teachings. But as long as a church is teaching false doctrine, how can the people understand what to follow? The reason the churches are failing is because people who are truly searching, and I mean truly out there, they are digging for truth, are realizing they're not finding it in their modern Christian church. They're realizing they can't, they can't get it. So they're looking around other places. They're coming to people like me, which is hard for me to believe. Because here, you know, I can, I can tell you when Yeshua says something, he means it, right? And I hope you believe me when I say that. When he says, when he answers the question, what do I have to do to enter into life? And his only answer is keep the commands. Follow the instructions. Live the way you're designed to live. And and I'm, I have people every well not every day but practically every day try to convince me that's not a salvation issue. Yeah, it is. Straight from the words. Now, if you now if you have one of those red word Bibles, I bet you, it's in the red words. You know, as Larry the Cable Guy likes to say. I believe Keith Johnson 
came out with a, a red word thing not too long ago too. He is a former United Methodist pastor. He had to make a choice as well. And he chose to follow the Almighty instead of the doctrines of men. What are you going to do? It's up to you. You have the choice. You have the opportunity. You have all of these things available to you. You have the information. What are you going to do with it? I can't make the choice for you. Nobody can pray you into heaven. Nobody can pray you out of heaven. But what they can do is pray that you have the opportunity to make the right decision. And the time is running out. The battle between good and evil is heating up. Not just in a foreign country. Not just in the United States. All over the world. Before I stop tonight, I want to remind you something I have said time after time after time. And that is this. <clears throat> The landmass known as the United States is not uh, directly under the control of the Creator. If you look in the Torah, you're going to find that the 70 nations that were divided were given out to 70 uh, divine beings to care for. In Psalm 82, there is a warning to those beings that if they allow things to happen like are happening in the United States today, they will die just like mortal men. I don't know what the name of the divine being is that takes care of this land mass we live on in the United States. I really don't care. But I know what's going to happen to him. The only place, the only place in the entire world that the Almighty has reserved for himself is that little bit of peace right there along the, the Mediterranean known as Israel. That little strip. He wasn't greedy. You know, he didn't take a whole continent. He took just a little country. So this is all I need. Watch what I can do with it. Because of our rebellion, we're going to see how bad things can get. Any biblical prophecy that's given was not given for the United States. It was given for Israel and the people of Israel. I'm going to give you one more warning. I suggest you join yourselves to the people of Israel, not the nation, not the political government, the people, the children of Abraham. Because only by doing that are you going to survive. Only by doing that are you going to understand that living the way you're instructed to live, the way you're designed to live, the way... The Almighty has given you the opportunity to live. That is living today. You want to see what the new Jerusalem looks like? Then you have to live the way He designed you to live today. It's that simple. Are you going to get it right? No. And that's okay. You're not going to get it right. You're going to make mistakes. You know, in, in Ecclesiastes, Solomon said, even the righteous will sin. Even the righteous are going to screw it up every once in a while. And it's okay. But you have to try. That's the big deal. You have to try. I really wasn't expecting to have to do... Uh, go that far into what I just went into this evening, but churches are failing. And they're failing because they're not teaching what Scripture says to teach. 
They're teaching because what they think they need to teach to get people in the door. They're teaching, don't you want to go to heaven? When Yeshua said in three places, in Matthew and in Mark and in Luke, if you want to inherit eternal life, you have to live the way you're designed to live. It's that simple. It's that easy. That's just the way it is. So, my advice? <laughs> Go to GiveGodNani.com. In 90 days, you can turn your life around and live the way you're designed to live. It's the simplest way I know to do it. Little steps at a time. Just a little change. Just a little change every day. Something you can live with. I'm not asking you to give up coffee. Nope. I'm not doing that at all. You can have all the lattes you want. It's okay. But what we are asking, what we are suggesting, I should say, if you want that true personal relationship with your Creator, just do the things He asks you to do. Start every day with prayer. End every day with prayer. Benefit the people around you using the gifts that He gives to you. That's basically what that 90 days teaches you to do. Use the gifts you were given to learn how to benefit the people around you so that you improve your life and you have the opportunity to be a blessing to someone else so that other people can see that and bless you in return. Folks, I certainly do appreciate all of the kind words you had there from Meyer. Um, I know she is appreciative of that as well. Hopefully, she'll be well enough on Monday when we do uh, Monday's podcast. And, and remember, that's not on Facebook. And by the way, not sure how much longer I'm going to be on Facebook. Uh, I will stay there because I know that there are some people who can't get this other places. But it's also why I'm starting to put videos back on uh, GiveGuy90.com so that uh, we will be able to get you some video there because I know a lot of people like that more than just the audio alone. Uh, either way, uh, we appreciate each and every one of you. Until next time, until next time, I really uh, trust each and every one of you will have a blessed, blessed week. Thanks for watching.